Hey, everybody, this is Doug C. Brown with the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. I have Mr. Oren Klopper. Uh, he owns a company called NetSureIt. And we're going to talk a lot today about blue ocean, red ocean strategy, as well as how do you take some of the meaningful things that happened in your life, good or bad, and, and how they are as tipping points in your life and how that can fit into your blue ocean strategy. So the blue ocean strategy is, you know, how do you find clear water so that you can, you know, propel your, your boat forward, if you will, swim without the sharks, so to speak, in the world of business. Without further ado, let's go speak to Oren right now. Hey, Oren, welcome to the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. Thanks so much for being here today. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Doug. You have a really cool background. Um, and uh, I've been doing a copious amount of reading about you because I find your, your background so fascinating. Before we go there, why don't you tell people what your company does so we can set the frame? Sure. We're uh, an IT services business. So we are an IT department for our customers. And the ideal customer profile is a company that has 25 to 1,000 users or computers and uh, we either are their IT department or we augment their IT department. So the day to day, we're looking after all of the IT from their service desk to, uh, you know, all of the day to day IT problems. And then at the, at the top of that day to day operations, we have a service called Innovate, mm -hmm. where we actually guarantee an ROI based on automation, adoption, productivity that we find. So if at the end of a 12-month period, assuming the, the agreement is $5,000 a month, we commit to finding $60,000 worth of ROI. If we don't, we continue until we do. That's pretty cool. Not a lot of people look at business that way as they're giving a, a, almost a guaranteed ROI. Well, it is a guaranteed ROI, really, because you're going to keep searching one way or another until you, until you find it. So it's pretty admirable in, in companies. And for those of us who are selling, I mean, what if we did the same thing, right? We, we go in and we guarantee it kind of an ROI in, in our actions. So uh, how much better would our relationships be with our people and, uh, and how many more referrals and and, uh, you know, uh, expansion of the sale would happen uh, due to that fact. Uh, Oren, you, you and I were talking about Blue Ocean, Red Ocean, because you, your company now, I mean, it's 350 people strong and growing. I know you guys were in the Inc. 5000. Um, I mean, you've got all kinds of awards and accolades uh, from, from what I read. How it's interesting to me now that you're looking at like a Blue Ocean, Red Ocean kind of strategy. Right. And, and I think a lot of companies should look at this. But you're, uh, I would say, forthright enough or intelligent enough to look forward <laughs> and say, okay, where are we going? Why can you speak to the blue ocean, red ocean process that you guys are going through right now? Yeah, sure. It's, you know, I would love to be able to say as an entrepreneur and as a business, you kind of come up with your strategy and go to market. Uh, at least for us, it would be great if we didn't have to rethink and relook and reinvent ourselves. But, you know, in our market, there are about, 20 to 30,000 companies in the US that do what we do uh, in some form or another. So if you go back 10 years, how easy it was for us to get leads was a much lower investment than it is today. So just as a function of competitiveness, we, and it kind of started, Doug, actually at the end of 2019, as we went into 2020, where we looked uh, the reality in the eye. Our organic growth, if we stripped out a couple of extraordinary deals that came from upsells and customer referrals, was in an absolute hole. And looking at that reality and what we were investing in marketing, we realized we needed to, we needed to disrupt ourselves from within. So we went through a huge process. And uh, out of that, we re-looked at our core offering, and we also came up with our Innovate offering. 
which is really, I'm not aware of any of our competitors that are doing this offering in that way. So this is what we're putting into our marketing engine. We're leading with that messaging. Because if you if you look at, even at Google optimization or whatever it is you're using to get leads or get in front of customers, they're all saying I'm an MSP, which is the uh, term industry term for our type of business. We'll yep. look after your IT, we'll guarantee service levels, or we'll look after your cybersecurity. But where we arrived at is this innovate offering where what we found is so many of the, our customers and the market, they've spent a fortune on technology and they're actually just not realizing the return of what, on what they've already invested in. So this innovate service sits on top of that. And um, we've seen some great initial results. Uh, and we look, it's, it's, we're kind of a year and a half in uh, with this new blue ocean offering. And I suppose it's just a matter of time with a lot of blue oceans that it starts to become less blue. But right now we, uh, you know, I'm still excited to see that uh, we're, 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 we're being unbelievably well received in discussions with our customers around this offering and the fact that we're willing to take this risk. So how important, I mean, you've been in business for a long time. Right. I mean, you started in 1980. It was no, 80. 90. Officially, we have a, a sort of a, a company tax ID since 1997. Oh, so 1997, you started in business. You've been going at this thing for well over 20 years at this point. How many times have you reinvented this blue ocean strategy in your in your business? Or embraced it anyways throughout? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a good question. Look, I think the step that almost precedes that is we've we've always taken quite a an, an invested approach to strategic planning. And it, in some years, uh, Doug, I think we've overdone it, and in other years we've un, we haven't put enough energy into it. Uh, because what can happen if you don't do it thoroughly? In our experiences, not enough people feel involved and buy in. And if you overdo it, the layer of work we're putting on top of people that are already running the business and their departments and their functions can really create negative energy. So I think we're in a place now where it's quite balanced. And what I'm going to say now might sound quite rudimentary, but it really starts with the SWOT. What are the internal strengths? What are the internal weaknesses? What are the external opportunities? What are the external threats? And then out of that, we're getting a sense of where the market is at, where are we strong, where are we weak, where are we winning, where are we losing? And in that, it almost forces us to face the reality of, you know, are we differentiated or not? So if you look at Porter's Five Forces, um, and so each year, in a way, we're running a version of a blue ocean review to understand how we're doing. And I think the, the one that we initiated starting in 2020 was probably one of the most radical blue ocean reinventions we've actually ever done. I think if you look back uh, when we entered the US market, when we did our first acquisition in the US back in 2016, that in itself, just from a geographic expansion, where we did do some pivots in how we service our customers and the service guarantees that we offered, uh, that was another reinvention, uh, which was 2016. Yeah, so we've probably done it four or five times over the history of the business. That's pretty fascinating because, you know, I, I know a lot of companies, there's all size companies that are listening to this, or right? So some are, you know, your size companies, some are all different sizes. And yes. what, what, I'm, what I've noticed is some of them are like, when you talk about blue ocean strategies, it's kind of like, well, what does that really mean? Right? Like what, what I, you know, I'm a, I'm a plumbing company. Why do I need to look at like things that my competitors aren't doing where maybe I could, you know, could you speak to that? Like from a, yeah, from a CEO so. or a founder's head, where, where, where do you got to go to grow and continue? Yeah, so, sure. you know, probably one of the, 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 the examples that landed it for me so clearly in the book was Cirque du Soleil, where it wasn't theater and it wasn't the circus but it was a space that existed between those two where the, the performers were not rock star 
actors or clowns or so forth. So they didn't necessarily receive this very high premium pay and they charged significantly more than what you would potentially pay at the theater or at the circus. So, and they ver- there are a whole lot of variables in the book. And I just saw recently that they've released a new book. I can't remember the name offhand, offhand but it's the same authors as Blue Ocean Strategy. But you ha- re- if you have not read Blue Ocean Strategy, it's an easy read. I grab it on audio if you, if, you, if you don't have time to sit with a book and listen to it while you're working out or driving or whatever it might be. So that's one example. I think it was Lockheed Martin was another example where each year the Navy the 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 three different parts of the US military would all have their own uh, aircrafts uh, have a spec for the aircraft they wanted and they would go out to market and and Boeing and and Lockheed Martin and all of these organizations would tender and then one of them said what happens if we created an aircraft that met the needs of all three parts of the military And then so essentially now they created what you can say in essence in the military world is a blue ocean and it wasn't looking just at those independent parts of it. So in our business or in any organization, it's it's where you take your core offering or something possibly adjacent to it, and you differentiate it so deeply that essentially your potential customer cannot really compare it to anything. It's, in, it's almost like, well, it's not this, but it's not quite that. And it gives them the sense of, wow, this is connected to what I really need. I can't really compare it to anything. So you're able to build in a pricing premium where you're not facing the pressures of where a market is commoditized. So the red ocean being lots of competition, everybody's trying to compete. They're trying to compete on price. They're undercutting each other. And and whereas in a blue ocean, you're almost, you have almost no competition or very few competitors and you can demand a premium price and it's deeply connected to the value that it will create for your potential customer. You know, when you, when you're saying that I I was thinking about Disney right back in its day, like Disney came in with this whole new concept that like nobody could really compete on. And obviously the Disney today, and then they spread out into different industries, you know, besides the film industry and the entertainment industry of the, the, um, you know, the parks and, but they're into everything, right? I mean, so now what about a company that's like going, all right, you know what, I'm doing $5 million today and I'm not Disney. I don't have 350 employees. I, I, but I, you know, I do want to find my blue ocean. What, how did, how do they kind of go about it? I know it's doing the SWOT analysis you said, right? Strengths, weaknesses. Yeah. You know, if I were, if I were, if I were running a $5 million business today and I were listening to this show, what I would probably do is I'd go and listen to the Blue Ocean Strategy book. I think that thinking is still 100% relative. There's some very simple tools where you can literally map your industry and map your business and see how it compares to your industry. And then the book explains how you can pull those levers. And probably another book I would go and read, Doug, which I've very seldom done uh, an audio book five times one after the other, this is the, this is my record, is the $100 million offer by Alex Hormozzi, where he talks about ways that you can create your own blue ocean. And some of the dynamics in there are just so simple and easy to grasp. And I think the applicability of it to, e- to each business is different, but it's a super worthwhile listen. No matter what you do, it's a worthwhile listen. He's, he talks about... You know, so, so you might have you, you might have seen it uh, for anyone who's listening in your industry where some organizations serve all industries. So they serve financial services, marketing, legal, et cetera, et cetera. So the moment you develop a, a deep understanding and competence in a particular industry, and then even drill further into that, into a particular vertical within that industry. So take, for instance, financial services, then go deep, deep into financial services and say, now you're looking at wealth management, or let's say private equity. Now you build an offering that is deeply connected to what private equity firms really, really want. And you offer some kind of guarantee in it because you know the space so well, you know what their pain points are. Immediately now you've created a bit of a blue ocean for yourself. 
Mm. Um, you know, so uh, I think there's, the, and, and the book goes on to explain, uh, look at your local geography is the one piece of what he talks about. Look at the role. So CFOs in Boston that are leading a, a manufacturer, that are CFOs of a manufacturing company that has between 50 to $100 million in revenue. Uh, we have a, a cost management and reduction program. You know, so th- it's those concepts of making it very tailored and specific to the audience. And I think the other piece of it would be to just really make sure sometimes even in a even in a business of $5 million, at times as the leader, you can become disconnected from the customer voice. And you've got a couple of account managers maybe managing that front line, and you've got a salesperson who's doing most of the sales. How do you get close to both the new business opportunities and the existing customer? Because that listening very intently and clearly that blue ocean starts to become clearer, especially if you've got the framework in the back of your mind. That's fascinating. Like I, 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 I apply this to sales for people, right? So it's like when I'm talking to them, like I was a, uh, I was a rep for a company called Paytech Communications and they sold eventually to Windstream, but I was their, I was their top guy. And what I did is I looked at, just as you said, look at the landscape and what are the people who could help me in selling and I could help them in selling? Where, where's kind of that blue ocean that nobody's competing? And what I looked at, Oren, was uh, the we had the the agent, the independent agent force that worked in our in our business. So they would go out and recruit companies or you know people to actually provide telecommunication services. And then we had our direct ch- sales channel. And I asked the question. What if I could do both? What is if at a direct, I could actually utilize the agent model in the direct side because there's a certain segment of people who don't want to be writing their own orders, doing their own customer support, doing that, which is the what the agent would do because they had it 100% on their own. So I said, maybe I could like look at this hybrid model, if you would. And I, yeah. and I plunged into it and I actually became the number one rep in this company out of 315 salespeople just wow. going into that blue model, uh, that blue wow. ocean model, right? Because there were people who were like, yeah, I don't want, I don't need, you know, 25% or 20%. I'll take 5% commission, but I don't want to do any of the work. I want somebody to take care of all of this yeah. for me, right? And if I make an extra hundred, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000 a year for my company, but it's all profit, I'm good, right? Yeah. That type of thing. And so that's how I actually grew so, so much that I had 62 incoming calls a day coming wow. into my line from agents, I had to hire a couple of assistants when I was a rep. Right? Wow. So the, the reason I bring that forth is because I don't think people think enough about this blue ocean strategy, like, oh, well, geez, you know, Oren's this, you know, 350 people, of course, he's thinking about this, right, that type of thing. But how do I think along the path, whether I'm um, a $5 million company or sales rep, a uh, hundred million dollar company or, you know, $18 billion company. We, we all have to keep thinking that way, you know, through the process. Like we have a company uh, called Intuit here in the United States and they went, came out with something called Rocket Mortgage. I thought that was kind of a blue ocean strategy for them, right? But even yes. though it was competing. So how about when it applies like, by the way, folks, we're speaking with Mr. Oren Klopper. He owns a company called NetSureit. And uh, I, I love your backstory. Like you, by the time you were, and you were, did I read right that you went to like eight or 10 schools by the time you were 13 years old in South Africa or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. My, I, I went to my ninth school when I was 13 and uh, yeah, I like to always reflect and say, I only got expelled from three, you know, so <laughs> six out of nine is, is, is not, <laughs> is not bad. Look, and I think, you know, talking about sales, the one thing I realized quite early on as I changed schools is that the school uniform I had was so new that it had some had some value and I could sell my school uniform. Um, so that was one of the early ways in which I learned how to uh, sell something that had value that I no longer needed. Um, but yeah, I think as a salesperson, you know, we need to learn to adapt in any situation. And uh, I suppose one of the gifts of going to so many schools, not that I would want my daughter to go to so many schools. Um, and I do tend to reframe and look at the positive of things. But um, yeah, it was one of the things I definitely learned to adapt quickly. And uh, I think, you know, in the example you gave, which is really fascinating, 
is you as a salesperson or sales leader took the initiative to potentially create a, a value proposition that differentiated you and was your own blue ocean. And I think, I think all salespeople should be encouraged to do that because if, if any salesperson came to our sales leadership and said, guys, I actually see an angle here. If we connected this and connected that and I packaged that, I think we're going to get in front of more customers. And uh, I, I, I think that's a great story. Um, and, I, and I would encourage any salesperson or sales leader to, to think like that. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the reason I brought up the nine schools, because to me, it would be like, wow, that's a lot of change, right? And But yeah. I found, you know, it, and even in my life, you know, I started working really early with my dad's company because I think I had a need, like I was three years old and we, you know, I was there sweeping floors and we were helping wow. out when I was five and six selling stuff, right? I, I, my dad passed early and I never had the chance to ask him, did he need low cost labor or was he trying to teach us something, right? I wasn't really sure. But at, at times my friends were out doing things and I was working, but I was gaining skill sets. So, you know, to me, nine schools and, and, you know, in that period of time, it's like, it's a little, it's traumatic and in my, from my, you know, right. And so, and sure. for me, and me actually not really being out with my friends all the time, it was more traumatic to me to just be constantly working. But I look at life now as I'm, a, a, you know, a bit older, <laughs> far 61 years later or whatever. Yeah. I, lo I, I look at life now and I go, some of these connection points back when we were kids were actually what formed us to be the way we were. It allowed me to think that way. I'd like you to, if you wouldn't mind, I, I know I'm, we hadn't talked about this, but I'm kind of putting you on the spot. Do you think people should look at their lives as, you know, a connecting weave that gets them to this certain place. Like if, in other words, we all have stuff that happens to us in our lives, but it's how we sure. take it or not take it or, 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 or take the direction. So I'd like to yeah. have your feedback on that. Like stuff yeah, that happens sure. in our past, is it invaluable for your success as where you are today? For example. Yeah. I, I, th I think it's such an interesting discussion. I am. Um... I attended this program with a bunch of entrepreneurs uh, where it ran over about six years. And the one year we did it, we went to Stanford and um, the Stanford campus and we invited Simon Sinek to come and spend a, an afternoon with us, the, the author of Start With Why. And I, um, a friend of mine had brought him into his business and I knew kind of a little bit about his methodology. And the one thing he does, so he calls you out of the audience live. And he will ask you about seminal moments in your life. And a lot of them actually go back into someone's childhood. And uh, he has a way of peeling back the layers of the onion to get to those key tipping points, key inflection points, key points of meaning. And often they're embedded in adversity, sometimes intense adversity that saw you have to overcome, saw you build a level of resilience and resolve. And, um, you know, so I, I think there are those moments carry so much value. And as entrepreneurs and, and any sales, any successful sales leader or sales person, your ability to reframe and be optimistic, I think is a critical success factor. Because just think about it. If we got down and suddenly stopped doing every time we got a no, okay, <laughs> we would not have lasted very long, right? <laughs> so it's, you know, and I mean, I was, I was actually going to do a post on LinkedIn the other day. And I was thinking, I was thinking to myself, who are the people that kind of took a chance on me long before I possibly had that belief in myself. Um, and have I thanked them, you know, enough. So I'm pretty strong on the gratitude front. So I go out of my way to thank people. And sometimes I'll just phone them randomly. I haven't spoken to them in 10 years and just say, look, I want you to know that that door you opened had that. So I'll give you an example. We have a business in the U S today and it's a, it's our business in the U S is bigger than our business in South Africa. And it's growing exponentially faster because of an exec at Microsoft who I met at a conference invited us to um, to uh, be represented on a Microsoft Partner Advisory Council. Now that was back in 2004. And through those trips and journeys, I would fly through New York. And then it was on a trip in New York in 2015 that we ended up getting one of the members of our Partner Advisory Council, or someone I'd met through that as a customer, 
Then in 2016, we bought a business in New York. And now today, our business in New York and the US is significantly bigger than our South African business, and it's growing significantly faster. And I think we can all look back as entrepreneurs and salespeople and sales leaders and see people that have given us a chance. Because what I've seen is people love to see the underdog win. There's yeah. something in it, you know, like you just, there's this feeling. It's like this guy is keen. He's reliable. I see myself in him. I want to give him a chance. And I think knowing that and believing that as an entrepreneur and as a salesperson or a sales leader can give you a little bit of extra, a little bit of extra uh, uh, initiative and, and, and bravado in your outreach and what you do. That's awesome. Yeah, it's the, that's why I think everybody loves that the movie Rocky, right? The, because, you know, Rocky was the underdog and he was a likable guy. And, that's and, it. and I'd like to kind of tie this in. I mean, it may, may not be a good tie in, but I also think that trait when applied to a blue ocean strategy, because we have to have a we have to have a bit of strength when we're going into a blue ocean strategy to go, OK, I hope this is, you know, face, if you will, like I can, you know. I can win uh, at yes. this. And I think it all kind of ties together. And, and, and I think you did that so nicely and so neatly in a package. So thank you for that. <laughs> and I would challenge anybody listening to this to call a couple of people a day that have helped you out over life. Because as you said, Oren, it opens up doors yeah. too, right? No, for sure. For sure. You know, there's a great book. It's, 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 it's not that new. It's called Getting to Plan B by Randy Commissar and John Mullins, where they, they're really legends in the private equity and the venture capital world out of Silicon Valley. And they said 70% of every single business they funded fundamentally changed their business model over the next two to three years. Wow. So it's, you know, sometimes what happens, I think, as entrepreneurs, we fall in love with exactly how we've put everything together. And that's what we think is going to work. And we just keep on biting our heads against that until the, until we feel that the, the damn wall will break. But it's also keep going, persisting, but also listening and seeing what can I tweak? What can I change? Because uh, it's, um, you know, that's, I think change is a constant for all of us in, in the business world, whether you're in sales or sales leadership, or you're an entrepreneur. So a question on that change, can change also mean, Hey, we've been, we've been beating this, you know, process for a long time, Well, we got it to a certain point and we review it and then say, well, should we continue or stop? Yeah. So I think a big part of, of our strategy now is around acquisitive growth and the reality of a red ocean market is it makes it right for consolidation. So if you're in a market that is unbelievably competitive and you look at the heavy lifting required to create a blue ocean versus what happens if I took a liquidity event and rolled some of my equity and like take, for instance, the MSP market, Doug, there are almost 100 private equity firms that have invested in the MSP market in the US right now. So valuations are at really good prices. A lot of the guys running the MSPs, uh, a lot of the people running MSPs are uh, in their late 50s, early 60s. They're looking to liquidate. Um, so sometimes when, when the, uh, your, your, your market has become too much of a red ocean, it can be a good time to consider selling. That's fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. So Oren, how do people get to know, like, I'm sure they're like, their brains are going, wow, this guy's amazing. And they want to know more about you. They want to know more about your company, something. How do they get a hold of you? The best is to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, it's easy to find, find me there. I'm very responsive. Um, and uh, from there, uh, I can connect you uh, with someone in my team or we can connect directly. Awesome. Oren, I want to thank you so much for being a guest here on the CEO Sales Strategies and bringing your A-game. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'd love to have you back for, I, I know you're a mergers and acquisitions guy that's, you know, an expert in that and, and done quite well. I'd love to have you back on another episode if that's uh, good with you. Well, sure. And it's such a fascinating space uh, that your that your podcast covers. Um, so I feel that you could, you could, yeah, there's just so much content here. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity, Doug. Thank you so much. Did you ever imagine that points in your life that you look back on, you go, those were horrible. Oh man, those were awful. But those actually shaped how you got to your successful points and helped you build resilience 
that helped you overcome certain obstacles or resolve certain things in your life. And when you do those, believe it or not, we open up our channels in life and it tells the world, the universe, I don't know how it works. I know it just works this way. Listen, I'm ready for more, uh, bigger, better things, right? So if you're wrestling with trauma in your life for whatever reason, resolve it. Resolve it and move forward because it opens up other things for you. When you're looking in your business, whether, it, you know, and if as salespeople, you're in business, you're in business. If you're working for a company, you have the ability to affect and grow your revenue and your profits that commissions that you keep in your pocket by looking at blue ocean strategies at resolving those meaningful points in your life. And whether you're running a solo salesperson or running a team running companies, you know, whether you're doing a million, 5 million, 50 million, 500 million, or $500 billion, we're constantly going to be reinventing ourselves and looking for those blue ocean strategies throughout our business. If we want to continue on for decades and decades and decades in business, it's just how it works. So let's embrace it. So as always, if you love this episode, please give it a five-star review. If you are an expert or you know somebody who's an expert, we've had a couple reach out to us just re recently saying, hey, I'd like a subject matter on this or subject matter on that. Let us know what it is. Reach out to us at you matter, Y-O-U-M-A-T-T-E-R at CEO sales strategies.com. Let us know what your idea is. We get back to everybody. If it's a great idea for us and a great idea for you and you're the expert, we'll invite you on. If the, our other expert is the, the person for it and it matches the show, we'll be happy to have you on. If you yourself or someone you know is looking to be in that top 1% earners category, or you just want to move your sales from A to B, and you're like, you know, it can happen in your heart of hearts, but either you're sure and you're not sure why it's not happening, or you're not sure why it's not happening, reach out to us and let us know. All right. We are running a 1% academy in a university going forward. Uh, if you'd like to be on the waiting list for that, reach out directly to us. You can reach out to us at you matter. Uh, at CEOSalesStrategies.com for that as well, because you do matter to us. Also, we have a SaaS product coming out, an automated prospecting and follow-up system that's meaningful, relevant, and actually does the work, even if you can't. If you'd like to have more information on that, reach out to us at youmatter at CEOSalesStrategies.com. As always, this is Doug C. Brown saying, go out and sell something today. Sell a lot of it. Play, win, win. Make them happy. Make yourself happy. That's how you build a business. Play, win, win, right? Because if you play, win, lose, you win once, you're not going to win again. Think about recurring, repetitive business, expanding the sale, consistent growth in your business exponentially gives you the ultimate leverage. That's why you play, win, win. But go sell things profitably and make people happy today. Until next time, this is Doug C. Brown with the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast. If you want to reach out to me directly, you can come out at Doug at CEOSalesStrategies.com. Just send me an email there or Doug Brown123 on LinkedIn. Until next time, this is Doug C. Brown with the CEO Sales Strategies Podcast saying, make it a great day and to your success. Mm -hmm.